Thank you for coming, and uh, we're really thankful to Dee and Sean and the entire library staff for welcoming us uh, to put on this series of talks here. We don't really think of them as talks. We think of them as, uh, as we don't think of them as lectures. We think of them as talks. Um, and uh, we hope that you will continue to come uh, to the whole series, which is planned for through the spring and then into next fall. It's uh, my pleasure today to introduce Raphael Sassauer of the Department of Philosophy. When we uh, thought about who should launch this program, we didn't give it a second thought. We knew he should. And first of all, because many people in the community know him already from many of his uh, community activities activities. And uh, a few people here actually took some of his classes, uh, at least one, <laughs> and possibly others. So uh, since, come, since uh, getting his PhD at Boston University in 1985, uh, Professor Sassauer has done an amazing number of different uh, uh, jobs on the campus and an amazing number of community activities as well. And uh, I'm not even going to go into the whole long list, but needless to say, he has been chair of the department and he chairs a legal studies center and uh, he helped establish a, a, a big humanities program on our, on our campus. All of these things endure to the present day. And he's published extensively. I really, none of us know how he does it, but it, if you look at his uh, resume, you see like a book every year on top of conference talks and articles. Um, and he's particularly interested in public intellectuals and the role of intellectuals in public life. And that's something that he not only writes about in his books, but he talks about um, to other people and, and actively uh, is, uh, embodies that, that role within our community. He also is very interested in technology and uh, science in our contemporary era and has written extensively on those subjects. And uh, given that he has a background in economics as well, he's always been actively engaged in writing about economics. So if you go to the UCCS website and look under Professor Sassauer's uh, uh, webpage, you can see the whole I don't know, thousand page CV. <laughs> There's a lot of it there. But in any case, it's our great pleasure to launch this series of talks. And um, we thank you, Rafi, for being the first person to come up and do this for us. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I'll bring it up. Um, I. Yeah. Um, we, do have a, we do have a hearing loop. This room is equipped with a hearing loop, so if you have a hearing device and wish to set it uh, to the setting where it'll pick up the hearing loop, you will hear everything amplified. Um, just, just letting you know. And if you miss something, you haven't missed much, so don't worry about it. Okay. <laughs> I really believe in public intellectuals, as Professor Olkowski kindly uh, introduced me, and I really think that what we should do, and I'm not going to talk about today, is have those public forums uh, all the time. Uh, I think that uh, academics should be in the public giving talks on a weekly basis about any topic they're working on. So I don't, and uh, whether it's funded, how it's funded, uh, it's a whole other issue, and I've made some specific recommendations. So I'm glad to be here. I, I think it's my moral and academic obligation to be here, so thank you. The first thing I wanted to start with, uh, the topic was chosen nine months ago, so we gave titles and uh, I now had to think about what to say. Obviously, this is an impossible topic because you can talk about education separately, you can talk about digital technologies separately. To try and bring them together is quite difficult, so I thought I'll start with this image, some of you may have been part of the 120 million people who watched the Super Bowl this past Sunday. If you have, <clears throat> one of the things that seemed to me very odd, and it took me a while to catch on to it, <clears throat> it was played in this stadium. And this is the stadium of the University of Phoenix. University of Phoenix does not have any professional sports or teams. 
The stadium is 63,400. It's a relatively small stadium by many other standards. And it's a very odd stadium to have, or to have the Super Bowl in. And here, in, as I'm watching the game, I'm thinking, there's something here about the talk today. And the question that I would like to start with is, what is it about the University of Phoenix that actually, since 1976, has determined the context in which studying higher education, uh, or higher education is going to be discussed? As you all know, University of Phoenix is a for-profit university which was an anomaly at the time in 1976. I remember when we first heard about those things and said, this is crazy, it can't be true. Okay, it has to be state university, it can be private university, but they're not there to make money. How can you make money off education? Right? It's the most bizarre thing in the world. And University of Phoenix showed us that you can. So how do you do it? Well, first of all, you have to cut a lot of corners. And which corners do you cut? You cut on quality education. You cut on faculty. It's heyday. Peak enrollment in 2010 was 600,000 students. It was also the university that was most engaged in online education when it first became available. Heavily, heavily. Current enrollment, as of the end of 2014, is, as you see, 247. So apparently this experiment, which is, was supposed to be what we all follow, is not as successful as it may appear. I'm not even talking about the scandals, about funding, <clears throat> about trying to collect government uh, subsidies for funding, let's say, veterans, and eventually not enrolling them in the right courses or not having them finish the courses but getting their money, et cetera. I'm not talking about scandals. Google it, you can find too much, okay, to even cover it. But what I want to start with is to give you an, a, 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 a suggestion of the framework within which higher education or learning in the digital age is discussed today. It may not be explicitly so, but this is a backdrop against which has happened. So when we talk about August uh, institution like UCCS, right? People tell me in Colorado Spring, it's the only thing we can be proud of, which tells you something, right? This is a, a, a university that started as an extension of Boulder, as you all know. Uh, it had very few programs. It started in an old sanatorium. It had basically a building and a half to begin with, uh, and eventually it's now a thriving university. What interests me <clears throat> is not where we have come from. Chancellors like to talk about that because then they can show how much they have done. And so when you look at this graph, so the question is, I ran the PowerPoint presentation by my daughters so they can tell me how badly it's done or how to improve it. If you look on the left side, that graph can account for anything that happened in the last 50 years at UCCS. Why? Put anything on either axis and it goes upward. How many years, how many students? How many buildings, how many uh, over the years? Uh, enrollment increases, uh, financial increases, financial per student increase, uh, entrance qualification per student over time increases, all this so the left-hand uh, graph will describe anything about UCCS in the last 50 years. Everyone clear on that? Questions about that? <clears throat> Given that, we, that UCCS is racing to compete with the University of Phoenix, again, I said this is the standard against which all universities measure themselves. We'll get in a minute to Princeton. And you'll see that this is, unfortunately, not, not far-fetched. The question is, will UCCS in the next 50 years be on the left-hand column that is in that graph or in this one? And I think this is the question that should drive the discussion about what's happening in the next 50 years at UCCS. What can the graph on the right indicate? Quality, reputation, 
yeah, you, can, you may have another 50 years under your belt. Will enrollment increase necessarily? Will eventually students not come to places like UCCS because they can get their education online cheaper or just go to any one of those diploma mills and get it you know, in six months as opposed to four years? The infatuation with, the digi with digital technologies and online education can sink places like UCCS. Okay, so I'm, I'm starting with University of Phoenix going very quickly to where UCCS may or may not be. I don't know, I cannot predict where it will be. We have two options. We can either stay on the left in more than one sense, or we can move to the right in more than one sense, and at that point, the situation can be quite dire. And I want us all to remember that. One of the things that we do not talk enough about is reputation because it's hard to measure. We don't talk about quality. It's hard to measure. We can say that when I started UCCS in 1986, there were about 3,000 students. Now, almost 30 years later, they are close, there'll be 12,000 students. So it's quadruple in size. What does it mean? Are students better educated? Are we having more professors who teach them? In 1986, when I started, and into the early 90s, we were concerned about a 50-50 uh, split between tenure-track faculty and part-time instruction. We were alarmed. We were worried if this is going to affect accreditation. I don't know if you're aware of it, but UCCS slowly, slowly got a, se a separate accreditation for all the degrees and all the colleges and everything, okay? Originally, we were under the aegis of either Boulder or Denver, and eventually, it became independently accredited. In 1990, accreditation allowed 50-50% split between tenure-track faculty and non-tenure uh, faculty or part-time faculty. Would you like to know where it is today in 2015, what the ratio is? Okay. I, you probably don't want to know, but I'm going to tell you. 25% uh, tenure-track full-time faculty and 75% of instruction is taught by part-time and non-tenure faculty. Now, the good news, at UCCS at least, and again, I'll speak only about our department because I don't, thank God I'm not an administrator, so I don't know about other departments, but I know in our department, we're very lucky that all the people who are non-tenured all have PhDs. All have PhDs with, from good places, all qualified to teach. We're not doing what University of Phoenix does. Just for those who are interested, University of Phoenix claims on their website that they have to over 20,000 academic officers. Don't exactly know what it is, okay? I don't know if it means faculty, if it means part-time people, if it means just people who can uh, you're registered or can uh, administer, you know, uh, automatic uh, tests or whatever it is. So that's the worry. So I put it out there for us to consider that the new normal, the new standard for reputation and for quality higher education allows for 25% tenure track full-time faculty and 75% non-tenured or part-time faculty. If you ask why, once again, University of Phoenix gave the answer. It's cheaper, okay? Tenure-track faculty <clears throat> starting salary in philosophy is about $54,000 to teach five courses a year. An instructor at UCCS in our department teaches eight courses and gets paid $30,000 starting salary of $32,000. Part-time person who teaches just one course gets $2,500 per course. Is everyone clear on the math? Take a full-time tenure track position at 50 something thousand dollars teaching five courses, or pay someone $12,500 to teach the same number of courses <clears throat> on a one-by-one -one basis. They're much more easily fired. They're much more eager to please because maybe a job will become available and the university does the math very easily. That's why we are now moved from 50-50% to 75-25. I'm worried about it. I want to make it public. I'm sure if the chancellor were here, she would not want me to continue. So, 
So let's talk about the t digital age. <clears throat> the dates of it, <clears throat> uh, again, starting in the 70s, and you all know the story of the digital age or digital technologies and how wonderful they are. And we move from personal computers all the way to super connect connectivity, hundreds, thousands of books on the topic. I've written a little bit about it. And it's very seductive. It's very appealing. Uh, I'll give you one good, good news story since I've depressed you so far. Uh, when in 1986, when I asked a student, I don't know if, the, if I asked you that in those days, if I asked a student to rewrite a paper, they'd argue with you. And the question, why? Or oh, in the 70s, if, when I was a student, why would we argue with a professor about revising a paper that wasn't that good? It wasn't a typewriter. I had to retype it. Cut and paste, which we see on computers, right? was literally people cut and paste, right? And then you had, sec you, had, you had pools of secretaries who typed, or typists. Or you paid someone a dollar a page, I remember, to type, retype a paper. Before I'm going to go through all this hassle, I'm going to argue my position as strongly as possible. By the time we get the person on computer, the good news is you tell a student, listen, I, where's your thesis statement? It's buried in page six. I said, no problem, I'll be back in five minutes. Right? I can do it on my phone. I'll just move it and I'll print it for you. So intellectually or cognitively or, or pedagogically, obviously there's some great things that the digital age has done. Okay? And if you use them in those ways, <clears throat> there's, a, there's a great advantage that can be ahead with it. But like with all these things, there are two groups who respond to the digital, digital age. The other technophiles and the technophobes. Uh, it's fascinating. I wrote about this kind of stuff about science 30 years ago, and I still write about the same stuff. Because technophile and technophobes stay as these two camps, no matter what the technology. It can be a, an argument about the industrial revolution. It can be an argument about any new scientific. There's always people who are scared and hated or worried about it, and people who applaud and welcome it with open hands. Here are the standard arguments <clears throat> about the digital age. Uh, obviously, that you know, it's progress. Things only get better. Nothing gets worse. We know more, we have more access, it's quicker, it's simpler. And what we really focus on in the it's the best of all worlds is really on the material conditions. Okay? That was the argument about the Industrial Revolution. It continues to be the argument about the dig digital revolution or any new revolution we'll see uh, that has to do with technologies. The, more interesting, of course, and this is a whole other lecture, is how digital technologies really helped enlighten or can help us overcome any sense of superstition. And this, again, these are all the arguments that get recycled nowadays as well, and how we really move from data to knowledge. Again, libraries on a good day can be a good place for, to have that discussion, okay? It's a collection of data, but how do you move data to knowledge? K through 12 on a good day can do it. High education on a good day can do it. <clears throat> on a bad day, they just give you the data, okay? And that's it. So that's really where there's added value uh, in, in education. I also think that there's a, a political dimension to it in the third point, where is a question about power relations. The authority of the word of an expert, the authority that was in the hands of those in power positions is much more diffuse in the digital age when we have access to information in a much easier way. I'm not going to listen to you and just because you tell me that I should count on you knowing what you're talking about. I'm going to second guess you, okay? This happens in medicine all the time as an example, right? You go to your doctor, nine out of 10 people before they go to the doctor check some of their symptoms or Google them before they go to the doctor. So they're now arguing with the doctor before the doctor even can give a diagnosis of their, of their whatever symptoms they may present. Good news, bad news. Doctor now doesn't have the kind of power position he or she had 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 
obviously there's a price to it. The fourth one is also a notion of accountability and transparency. On a good day, everything that happens in this library right now is on a website. You can check it out. Everything that happens at UCCS, go to the website, check it out. The one thing you cannot check at UCCS website, anyone can guess? One thing. No, grades you can't. Whoever has access to them, it's on a website. What is not on the website? The only thing is not. Drives me nuts. Budget. Fascinating. Money. You know, follow the money, obviously, for power relations, right? The budget is printed. It's available in our library. And you can take it out. You can check it out for an hour. <laughs> Fascinating, right? Why isn't the budget transparent? Okay. Is the US government budget transparent? Is it on a website? For those of you who ever try to navigate it, as I do every once in a while, it's not so easy. Okay? It's not so easy to get raw numbers or big numbers. Okay? You have to go through census data. You have to go through all kinds of, and it's, it's actually a lot of work. <clears throat> In a week or two, you can figure out somehow what's going on. But you're not going to get those nice pie charts that tell you this is how much for defense. This is who actually puts those together? Obviously, think tanks on the right and the left when they want to make a point, but that's a whole other story. And <clears throat> the last one is obviously some improvement in human health and well-being, everything from medicine to, I would, some people say even spiritual health, right? You can, uh, you can have access to yoga okay, through digital technology. You don't have to go to a class if you live in a remote area. Uh, for medicine, you know, the latest application on smartphones is to remind older people to take their medicine. I don't know if you're aware of it, but about half of problems with the elderly in terms of health care issues is not having follow-up and maintenance of regimes that have been prescribed by physicians or nurses. So if you have an app that reminds you, that's fine. I remember my mom in her last year, and she had no idea what she was taking or not. And then, of course, the other technophobes. Okay? This is the worst of all words given any yardstick. Okay? Uh, most of you can think about, uh, and we'll get in another slide, uh, but I'll mention it already now. The latest studies claim that Individuals with smartphones spend an average of three hours a day on their smartphone. And the question is, doing what? And the answer is unclear. <laughs> you have a tick. I'm sure some of you showed up here before the lecture started, and you have a smartphone, and you didn't just listen to D to turn it off, but you checked it. What, what was so important to check? And we do it, so it's a habit, it's addictive. There's something, and that's why it's awful, okay? We have, I'm sure you remember the scares about 10 years ago that if you use your cell phone too much and keep it close to your ear, you're gonna get brain cancer. You will die, okay? So again, it's the worst thing that ever happened to us. The more we have those digital technologies, the worse it's gonna be. The tranquility and sustainable, sustainable environmentalism is going to be replaced by alienation, both materially and spiritually. The critique of Karl Marx from the previous, it's not previous now, it's two centuries ago, 19th century, is haunting us till today, okay? Material abundance, the way it's described sometimes by digital technologies, actually exacts a very high, high price, and the fact that you have more things or that you use more things more often does not necessarily mean that A, it's sustainable in any spiritual or physiological uh, way, or that it's really improving your life. If anything, it can make you miserable, okay? Somebody is trying to contact you. How? You don't know, so you check. You check your phone, you check your... Uh, internet account, you check the other internet account that you use, don't use so often, you ch as opposed to, okay, there was only a mailman who showed up once a day, and what came in the mail, that's all the information you had. That's it. All you needed. There's exposure, and again, we talk a lot more about that, from NSA scandals to otherwise, right? 
you have personal exposure. Uh, the argument here is that it's bad even if you are voluntarily contributing to it. Okay? Uh, the geniuses who put their nude photos then are upset that their nude photos go viral. The people who get drunk at parties and then those photos get used against them in a job interview. Uh, you know, so exposure, it's dramatic. It's dramatically different, sometimes by choice, sometimes not, sometimes through surveillance, sometimes uh, by self-exposure. Uh, we still don't know what the effects, long-term effects of that is, okay? We really don't know. We, some studies have shown that psychologically, uh, those kinds of uh, intimate connections you have with digital devices are actually making you less prone to have social, whatever normal relations would otherwise demand or expect of you, okay? Uh, for those of you who remember, Osberger was diagnosed or made more publicly known about seven, eight years ago. Uh, my guess is within, it's like, like ADHD, right? My guess is within five years, half the population is going to be declared Asperger on the Asperger spectrum. And the, uh, for those who don't remember Asperger uh, cases or syndrome or what the issue is there, is not being able to read social cues. So how would you know how to read social cues if all you do is deal with your cell phone and your laptop or your tablet? Shift from uh, compassion and empathy of a small community to a global uh, uh, community where those qualities not only are not nurtured, there's no way to actually test them or to actually practice them most of the time. How do you, ex how do you uh, display empathy uh, in your texting? By writing the full word as opposed to just a symbol? I mean, how, how, how do you express that? Uh, I mean, making a, a, a sad face, you know, or a smiley face is an expression of empathy or human relation. Is this really the most we, we're going to uh, deal with? That's a question. And obviously, the last one is we get disconnected. And as you can see, all these, uh, again, the hundreds and thousands of images. But whenever you want to say, technophobe or someone who's critical of science and technology, you can't but end up with, you know, Auschwitz, Hiroshima, and Nagasaki, right? I mean, that's, that's kind of the, the, the refrain that is going to be mentioned, right? Auschwitz, Nagasaki, and Hiroshima would not have happened without great advances in technology. This is the price. It's a huge price. This is the price we're willing to pay. Do we know what the next price is going to be? The, the scandal with an NSA, as far as we know, is, is nothing at this point uh, in terms of what, it can, what kind of disasters can really uh, befall us, either individually or as a country. So here are the technophobes. Here are reports from the internet. And this is something that, again, as we are talking about digital age, Again, data is wonderful to collect. Usually it's useless, but I hope some of this will be useful. So look at the red one. There are about over a billion users of Google search out of 7 billion. So Google search, for example, is not a, a, a simple phenomenon that is going to come and go. It has become entrenched now. It's become entrenched in conversations. I don't know how often it happens to you, but when I have intelligent, I hope, conversations at dinner table, invariably somebody pulls out the smartphone and says, well, let me check. Again, good news, bad news. Yeah, everyone is on their toes. They can't bullshit as often as they would otherwise, but that's not a conversation. That's like, OK, let's check my Google search compared to your Google search. And if I can bring it up on my cell phone quicker than yours, then therefore. So, but this is. More than 8 million people view Wikipedia pages per hour. Per hour. Just think about it. And since we have a globe that we deal with, 
It's 24 hours, right? Seven days a week, okay? But what is interesting, so again, Wikipedia, I remember when it first appeared in 2001, we had great debates in the academy whether citation from Wikipedia should be accepted or not. I'm sure I have some colleagues in my department today who are still leery or suspicious of Wikipedia uh, referencing. Should it, should it not, for citation purposes? It is better than, is it better than Encyclopedia Britannica? Is it not? Why? According to what criteria? Is it better or not? And we'll get to a minute what it means to learn in the digital age in the next slide. So when you look at this, one of the interesting things that defies all the economic models of University of Phoenix and or any other neoliberal argument is that 100 million hours of human hours were contributed to building up Wikipedia. None of the people who added, edited anything or added any content get name recognition. They don't get paid on name recognition. This defies every economic model we have proposed in the last 100 years. Okay? This comes as close to socialism on a good day that Marx could not have even envisioned. How do a bunch of people collaborate willingly okay, for the love of knowledge? Not even, I, I'm sure like some of my colleagues, get requested to contribute to uh, encyclopedia entries. And I do, but my name is there. I'm an expert on X, whatever the X that I was asked to do. Here, you don't know even who did it. They have now pay, an, a paid army of people who check, okay, and fact check those kind of entries, which is also interesting, okay? So, also Wikipedia may become as robust or more than Encyclopedia Britannica as a new standard bearer for knowledge, okay, or for how we learn, uh, you know, or how we gather data. On books use, it's all interesting, and this is the last tidbit that I already mentioned. There are two basic models of learning. We, I know we, uh, this talk is about learning, but we need some clean up some background. There are two models, again, philosophically. Uh, one is the uh, Socratic model, already talked about in one of the dialogues in the Mino, and this is really a theory of recollection. So on some level, what it says is there's really nothing new under the sun because there is the theory of the soul that gets, you know, transmigrated, if you wish, in Greek, also in some Eastern uh, philosophies. All we need is to have the right midwives, called teachers, on, on a good day, who can help deliver the knowledge you already have. The, the example given in the Mino, Mino was a slave, and Socrates proves to the learned people of his Athens that, in fact, even the slaves know some, I think, geometry or whatever it was, some uh, basic level mathematics. He asks him all these wonderful leading questions, and the slaves gives the right answers. Hence, the slave knew it before it was told to you. Okay? It's almost a deja vu-like that happens to you sometimes when somebody tells you something, yeah, I knew about this. I just didn't recall it as well. So that's one theory. So in fact, all we need to do is have midwives, which is the term he uses. The second model is that we absorb it from the outside, and that the more the merrier, and then, the, again, I, I'm sure you've read all these sensational stuff, that if you uh, play good enough music uh, to a fetus in, uh, in mother's uh, uh, tummy, uh, that kid is, uh, that child, when born, will become a child prodigy in music. Or if you explain to them enough of, I don't know, quadratic equations, that kid is going to become a mathematician when he or she grows up, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the idea is how much to just give kids kids more than adults, uh, information as much as possible, and it has to be external, and that's why K through 12 is so important, okay? So these are two kind of standard views, and you see one is external, one is internal. The sources of learning, again, this is 
very uninteresting, but this is really where it's at, okay? 130 million children get educated, okay, every year. That's a big number of 320 million Americans. So just think about that. Uh, the race to the top, Obama's revision, so-called revision of No Child Left Behind. These are policies, the K through 12 policies. I'm not going to talk about K through 12. I'm not. It's not that I'm not interested in it. I think that this is not what I'm, what, what I'm like to talk about today. You, I promise you, Jeb Wood Bush will become a Republican candidate for president. Okay? If, if you're unaware of it, I'm announcing it. Okay? <laughs> he will talk about one thing and one thing only, which is what he did in Florida for K through 12. He will also remind everyone that half the kids in Florida right now, he may, I don't know, uh, are taught in charter schools. What he will not tell you is that most of these charter schools are for-profit schools. These are not nonprofits; they're for-profit. Back to the University of Phoenix model. That's why we started with it. It's going to haunt us till we die, okay? It is claimed by his critics that some of these schools, elementary schools, there's a two hundred to three hundred thousand dollar profit per year taken out of every school for the companies who run those schools. So for profit, I, I don't even know what it means to have a for for profit education, but that's where it's at. They, for those who are interested, there's post secondary schools, obviously technical institution, and then online education. What is interesting, in 2012, 5 million people were enrolled in online courses. What is much more interesting is that less than 5% of them completed their coursework. MOOCs, which was, you know, these uh, multi, what are they, uh, mass online something courses. Open. Open. Uh, mass open online courses is MOOC, okay? Less than 5% of people who take them complete them. So whatever number people give you, well, 5 million people are enrolled in MOOCs. Well, it's as meaningful or as meaningless in terms of what does that mean? Well, they may have opened the page or they may have even listened to one lecture, but there's huge dropout. And MOOCs are not touted as much in 2015 as they were in 2013. In 2013, there was huge pressure all the way from the president of the University of Colorado, who is a good oil man who knows nothing about education, just if you're unaware of it. Uh, we like him for some odd reason, but education is not his background. And, and that's the push. So the push was for online and MOOCs, and MOOCs eventually may not be the answer. Again, it may go the way of University of Phoenix. What should we study? Those debates keep on going. Again, if you are not aware of what is important, uh, I put there Auguste Comte, who is a sociologist, and the only reason I put him there because he's the one who created these famous triangles in which mathematics is the foundation at the bottom, astronomy, physics, chemistry, biology, sociology. As you notice, some fields are not even mentioned. They're so irrelevant, like philosophy is not even there, okay? Communication, all kinds of political science, economics, law fields, it's about, it was about the sciences. It was supposed to be from the most principled, profound, to more complex phenomena. That was Duhem's view. We eventually used those triangles to talk about, as you see in the center one, we talk about data, information, and knowledge as a process, okay, that moves along that. As you see the arrow on the left, we can talk in the other reverse triangle about data, facts, information, which is defined as meaningful data. Uh, there is knowledge, which is organized information. That makes it more uh, complex. Wisdom, which is applied knowledge. And enlightenment, the clarity of perception. Okay, I know it's hard to read from far away. So we move from data to enlightenment. And the goal is to have students enlightened. Or is it? And that's what we're going to discuss in a minute. 
Here you have other ways. This is how universities are usually set up. You have the uh, natural sciences, one circle. Uh, what are these? Humanities, social sciences, and applied sciences. This is usually professional schools like public affairs or nursing school, things like that. These are the applied sciences. And again, you have kind of interdisciplinarity or cross or transdisciplinarity in some of these overlapping areas between the natural, the social sciences, and the humanities. If you are not aware about what is important, and the reason I, I revert back to Comte, even though I don't like him, I revert back to him because what he set up, most higher education system accepted. So for example, and again, the humanities are not even there, but a professor, you are more likely to pay higher wages to the natural scientist on the faculty than the social scientists, than humanities. And the question is why? Are they worth more? The argument is usually made, which is a false argument, but I'll tell you what the argument is, that in the public sector, okay, in private industry, we need to be competitive with private industry. In private industry, they get paid more. Nobody in their right mind is going to pay anything to a philosopher, but they pay a lot of money to a biologist in a good lab of a big pharma. Therefore, we need to pay more to a biologist than a philosopher. So far, reasonable. The highest paid starting salary at UCCS is in the business school. Starting salary is over $100,000. So it's double of what the philosophy department is. Yeah, this is not sour grapes. I make enough money. I'm fine. But just listen to this. So the argument was, why would you pay a professor of business $100,000? And the argument was, because in the private industry, he or she will get more. Not true in the last Great Recession. Nobody was paying a PhD in business $100,000 in private industry. Okay? They were not even paying that kind of money to people in computer science. So it's a false argument. Again, the facts don't bear it. Why are they still doing it? Because of cult. Because the belief is that people who know math deserves to have paid more than people who don't. There are four ideologies of learning. I'm going now to the ideology of learnings. The first one, which we all, again, rhetorically endorse, is the one that says that learning is about enlightenment. I showed you in the previous slide how we move from data to knowledge to enlightenment, right? In that kind of ongoing process. So that idea comes already from the 18th century, from the enlightenment period. Immanuel Kant is, is famous for have written specifically about those issues and goes all the way to the 20th century, the pragmatist, the American John Dewey, who wrote a lot about education, who himself started a school in Chicago and actually experimented and tried some of his own ideas or philosophies or principles. And the idea is that we are moving, again, for those who can't read it from far away, so as to free humans from their shackles of laziness and ignorance, ideals of equality and freedom, potential human perfectibility. That's the idea of enlightenment. Okay? So if we look back at specific policies, no child is left behind, or the race to the top, or any one of those kind of cliches or one-liners that are good for, uh, for the media, the idea is that any kid could be enlightened in principle. Everyone has the makeup. Because if you say that that's not the case, you're all of a sudden tampering with other principles like equality and freedom. If you're going to maintain those principles of equality and freedom, you can't say, some people are really dumb, don't educate them. They need to collect garbage. Some people are really smart, you educate them, they need to be college professors. Can't do that. Enlightenment says, here are the principles that we abide by, and according to that. There was something outrageously romantic and beautiful about that view, okay, that any one of us can be enlightened. Okay? I'm sure some of us teach at UCCS because we really believe in it. Because we really believe that however underprepared our students may be coming from K through 12 in some places in Colorado, they can be enlightened. They can be as good as anyone in our Ivy League. 
Okay? And truthfully, we have proven that that's the case in many, in many uh, ways. The second ideology, and a completely, uh, if you want to think of it in those sense, a negative, nasty one, says learning is about indoctrination. It's not about enlightenment. It's not about freeing people. It's really about socializing them. It's about state-run, whether state-run you mean in federal level, state of Colorado, or even local PTA. State-run, sanctioned institutional learning, where ideal principle norms and codes are presented as the truth, but in fact reproduce dominant and hegemonic power relations. So for example, ways, I mean, one of the great uh, writers about it is, is not an American, but his name should be mentioned, Paulo Freire, who has written quite extensively about it and shows to what extent textbooks, for example, replicate a very specific ideology of the nation and reproduces it. Now, the extreme cases and the nice cases. Extreme cases would be Soviet Union after the revolution. Everyone knows, right? They, they shoved down communist ideals under, uh, down everyone's throat, no matter what, okay? Same could be said about Nazi Germany, Mussolini, Italy, what, name, name a fascist country, that has been the case. Question, what about America? We must be free of that. And Ferrer says, not quite. You'd like to think that, but not quite. Start looking at textbooks, in specific period in American history, and you find that there are certain views that are being foregrounded, that are being reproduced, so to speak, or taught in ways that may, for example, minimize slavery. I don't know if you know that, right? Did we have slavery in America? Did we have it like for a year or two? Did we have it for a long time? For how long? What did slavery really mean? How did it affect the economy? What did it mean in terms of right? We believe that the Constitution talks about equality, right? Fundamentally and absolutely. If, if that's the case, how come women didn't get the right to vote in 1920? I don't know if you remember, right? 1776, 1920, a few years elapsed. What happened? How is a principle espoused in one hand not being taught in another hand? How did, why did women put up with this? What should they have done? What has, were they not enlightened? Obviously not. Why weren't they enlightened? What kind of indoctrination was going on for 100 years to allow the oppression, suppression of black Americans and women? Et cetera, et cetera, right? So that's his view. Very critical, uh, but again, based on some facts. The third ideology, again, started uh, in the 70s, uh, no, actually earlier, 70s and 80s, which says that what learning is about, and I'm, again, I'm, I'm focusing on higher education, so I apologize, I'm, I'm, I'm not as up on K through 12 that the university is a knowledge factory, and what we are training is people to have certain skill sets that are going to be useful for the industries in which they are needed, whatever that may be. So the university becomes now a functional, or has a functional uh, uh, role to play in the great American structure, politically, economically, culturally, et cetera. We thought that Kerr was dead, not just literally that he died, but that those ideas from the 70s and 80s may have kind of waned. University of Phoenix remind us otherwise, number one. Number two, and this is why I said we'll get to Princeton, so don't, let's not just pick on the little guys, right? William Bowen is a former president of Princeton University, just wrote this book in 2013, came out, Higher Education in the Digital Age, and he said, you know, I was skeptic of online education and the use of digital technologies. Now I'm a, I'm a believer. Question is, why are you a believer? And he said, that's the only way to cut costs. So the argument here is, okay, he's not saying that's the best way to educate. 
<laughs> this is not how education can be improved. This is not how the reputation of both the teacher and the student can be improved, or how he or she will be more enlightened, right? The first ideology, okay? He glosses over the second ideology. He's not even worried if it's indoctrination or not. He said, you know what? It's the cheapest way. So the way to talk about learning in the digital age is to talk about it financially. Let's not even talk about the slides I showed before is a waste of time. Like, what should we study? It doesn't matter as long as it's cheap. So it really doesn't matter what you study as long as it's done cheaply. That's a third ideology, okay? That economics or economic consideration will be the determinant of what kind of education you'll get, okay? And the fourth ideology, which is something that I'm uh, uh, more personally interested in, is to ask whether what happens in higher education is really a process of maturation. Because people always, especially the guy, what's his name, who is the co-founder of PayPal, he's offering, as you know, $50,000 to anyone who drops from college. He said, college is a waste of time. I'll give you $50,000. Come up with a good idea, and don't waste your time getting an education. It's a waste of time. Come up with a good idea about anything. I'll pay you to drop. Think about it. So my question is, how can we still justify and what ideological or what ideas or what principle can still be understood? It's a little related to the first ideology about enlightenment, but this one also talks about a process of maturation not only cognitively, but also personally and practically, okay? One of the things that a student after four years in college or university at least can do is multitask, that is take multiple courses in different colleges or departments and be able to either integrate the knowledge or think about it in different ways, but also be able to have different deadlines, meet deadlines, okay? You have certain decision-making skills, social habits, communication skills, writing, group presentation, public speaking, and more importantly, critical thinking. And critical thinking is something that, I don't know how to say it because it happens in my department, but one course in critical thinking is not going to give you critical thinking skills. I mean, that's a good starting point. You need at least that course. But critical thinking is about everything and anything. Okay? It's about who you meet and who you're going to marry. Okay? It's where you're going to eat or what you're going to eat. These are all critical thinking skills that are not, yeah, you get some foundation, some principle, some mechanical uh, pieces in a course like that, but it's a lifelong process. And you have to start, and I think college is a good place to do it because you have the luxury of being a little bit in a community where that is appreciated and welcomed, okay? I can't tell you how many of my students tell me that when they apply critical thinking skills either at home or at work, they're in trouble. Okay, I have reports of students saying they got divorced after taking some of our courses. We didn't intend for it, but they'll say it's the first time that I, I realized that the argument was invalid, or that I had my own argument, or that maybe the premises should be examined, or maybe you can't jump into that conclusion, or maybe it's too hasty. So, oh, okay, so actually some of the stuff actually filters, and you're using it. Or in a job, okay? How many bosses welcome criticism of what happens in the workplace? In the business world, I know only one guy, again, from personal experience with my brother-in-law, who actually used to pay people to criticize him. And that's Bill Gates when he ran Microsoft. He used to have on a weekly basis on Friday, he used to invite people from outside Microsoft to come and criticize. He paid them. My brother-in-law was one of them. I think they paid him five grand or 10 grand to show up and to tell him what he's doing wrong. I don't know what he did with this information, but at least you realize that there was a culture in which critical engagement is something that people are welcoming as opposed to shunning or shutting up. Uh, so, learning in digital age. I, I guess this is the title of the, of the talk. We have, how long do I have? Still? Okay. Uh, we had, have technophiles and technophobes, again. I could give a talk and saying, this is the best thing that ever happened. Digital technologies 
are what we need. We need more of it. We need to invest in it. It's the best thing we should do, et cetera, et cetera. The interesting part is that the, is the only, most of the studies is about K through 12 on that question, okay? That is, our students, our young students, especially in young ages, they learn some faster than others. The standards where we used to teach a class of 25 or 30, we taught the same thing to everyone. So now, some digital technologies allow for acceleration in a multi, basically variant way of teaching the same material to different, you know, students at different stages of their personal development, which is a crucial thing that happens between uh, age six to 18. By college, I think we are less worried about that, but we have some courses that offer it this way, right? I think geography department has a course in which a student takes, and whenever they pass the test, okay, on that week, they can take the next lecture. So you, if you're really, if you have nothing to do, you can probably finish the whole course in a day. Think about what I just said, right? You finish a whole course in a day, which means you retain absolutely nothing, but you got an A. So again, technophile, technophobe. Should I like it? Should I be critical of it? Uh, gaming, there's something interesting about gaming. So there's one study I read about gaming that asked the question whether gaming is uh, useful for social interaction. And there are some, author, there are some uh, experts who argue that through games, people who have Asperger or on the verge of autism, that is a really very low skills of interaction with outside world, are able to, after playing enough games, to interact with people. That through the games, they can see how to say certain things, how people react, and that the game can simulate social situation that makes it easier for them eventually to meet other people, or they meet gamers, or they can interact through the internet with other gamers about the game and eventually realize that they can interact with another human being and oh my god, there's a whole world outside of gaming. Gaming, as you all know, uh, sales of games, video games in the United States in 2014 was more than all the movies, TV shows, and all music sold in America. So video games, it's not a, a tangential little thing. Number one. Number two, if you think what the age group, the highest age group for gaming is, you will never guess. It's between 25 and 49. It's much older than I thought it would be, like teenagers who have nothing to do except for, you know, smoke pot and play games. No. It's an older generation. Older people are older. Not younger than me, but they're older. Uh, and then... Technophobes, obviously, that digital technology dumbed down learning, that it provides no focus or concentration, long, no long-term retention. There are huge studies about memory. Okay? Memory is a big deal because it's usually linked to dementia, Alzheimer, and that's why people are so interested in it. So the question is, the fact that the so-called computer or the website or the internet can remember for me, that is, I don't need to memorize anymore. Is that good news or bad news? I grew up in, a, in another culture in which I had to memorize the Bible. No, no, we did that. I also, I, we also had to memorize Shakespeare. And the question is, is it good? The, the old joke is, is it good for the Jews or bad for the Jews? They don't know. Some say that the fact that you don't have to memorize anymore clears your brain cells to do more important things. Some say, that you need to memorize because it trains the cells to have the circuitry work better for other skill and other functions that the brain does. So the answer is we don't know, okay? For any study on the one hand, I can bring you another study on the other hand. So we have no idea what we're talking about at this stage. Here are some interesting things that I thought you may uh, uh, care about. And the shift that I mentioned earlier between uh, moving from encyclopedias, let's say, to Google, one of the question is, what, what is, what is being questioned? What is at issue here? Is it just the functionality? Then it's not important, okay? 
whether it used to be in a paper form and not a digital form, nobody cares, right? The real issue is, whose authority did we accept in the Encyclopedia Britannica as opposed to at Google? Is the fact that there is no, no name associated to some of the sources of knowledge that librarians used to worry about, is this problematic? Is this liberating? Or is this even more scary, like a big brother is giving you this information, and that's what you have to know, right? As opposed to there, there's a name, so I can check up on that person who, is, who authored that entry in the encyclopedia. Two views obviously come to mind on the shift from scholarly resources to this kind of uh, broad base. One is Wisdom of the Crowd. I'm sure you heard about it. It was a bestseller book by uh, James, whose last name is unpronounceable. And what he said is, if one person asks the question, what you need to do is have as many people as possible give the answer. There's a very famous TED talk, I don't know if anyone saw it, in which they brought a cow on stage. Do you remember that? And they asked, how much does the cow weigh? And people got all cell phones, and they entered a number. And I think there were 3,000 people in the audience that collected all the numbers, divided them by 3,000, and they got the cow's weight, I think, two or three pounds off. Amazing. One person guessing is not good. And they said, if 3,000 people guess, the average answer, it will average out to be an accurate answer. And that was called the wisdom of the crowd. I hope you realize what we're talking about here, right? Pretty scary. This is really the diagram up front there, right? It's, it's those bell curves, right? And the bulk happens, okay, in the center. On the margin are the real geniuses. On the other margin are the people who have certain disabilities. And in the middle, that's what happens. And you look for the lowest common denominator. That's how you get an answer, okay? Should we go to Iraq to fight a war? Ask as many people as possible. And by the way, most politicians used to do that for a very long time. Bill Clinton used to be famous for that. Any question he was asked by the media, the first thing he said, I'll get back to you tomorrow. Had his people run a poll, OK? They polled. They did fairly good samplings. Whatever people said, the majority of them, that's what he said. That's why it was very popular as well, right? Just follow the people, and eventually you can as Obama was accused of, follow, I mean, lead from behind. So we have the wisdom of the crowd. Against that view, we have Nietzsche that we teach sometimes. These are sheep. This is a rock, right? The first sheep goes down, and the rest will follow, right? And they'll be dead. So is the wisdom of a crowd eventually going to kill us all? Nietzsche was worried about it. He said, you know, herd mentality is really dangerous. We need to worry about that because we can herd people into crazy ideas, right? Like what? Killing six million Jews. Okay. Most Germans were willing participants. How did we get? We were willing, I don't know if you remember, World War II, United States, right? The most shameful, probably the only, not the only, what's her name? Uh, Justice O'Connor said that there are two Supreme Court cases that she regrets in the 20th century. One of them, as you remember, was during World War II where the Supreme Court agreed that all American Japanese had to be interned. That was her mentality at the time. Fear tactics, scare, fifth wheel, maybe they are going to be enemies of ours of our great nation, we should put them in concentration camps, which we did. That was herd mentality, okay? There was public fear, there was public support for it. Supreme Court eventually agrees to it. Now we regret it, we even paid reparation, we even apologized, and we're on the verge of maybe apologizing to Native Americans, but that's a whole other issue. So, here's the shift, okay? Which one do you want Google or Wikipedia to look like and why? What are the appropriate filters? Now, as you saw in the previous slide, we move from data to knowledge to enlightenment. Part of what we're talking about is how to organize knowledge. How to figure out which knowledge or which data points are relevant or irrelevant. 
which are more susceptible to criticism and less, which will withstand criticism because it's accurate and which will fall apart because it's just somebody writing something, but it looks like a website and it looks like something we can rely on. Can I rely on it? Okay, that was the scare about should we reference Wikipedia or Google in research, okay? And obviously, this is a great little one, librarian, the original search engine, right? Which used to be the case. So, the interesting part is uh, the New Yorker, again, is the New Yorker a good reference or bad reference? Interesting question. This is, by the way, one of the few publications in America that has on staff fact checkers, people who check facts. Interesting. So here is something you need to know. Internet links. Out of 3.5 million professional articles in science, technology, and medicine between 97 and 2012, 20% of the links in the notes suffered reference rot, which means they disappeared. So 20% of the links disappeared. These are in scientific journals. How come? What happened to the website that eventually were linked to as reference or support for whatever was argued in, we're talking science, technology, and medicine. So we're not talking about philosophy. URL citation, 50% of citation in Harvard Law Review and similar journals, and 70% of citation in the Supreme Court opinions no longer link to their original websites. The websites are gone. So we are linked as a reference to something that was a foundation of the argument, and that's gone now, completely gone, erased from internet land. Okay, what, okay, so we say we need the enlightenment to be based on knowledge that is based on data, but if the data is gone, what's with the knowledge? What's with the enlightenment? What are we basing it on? Think about this. And that's why this is referenced, for those who, it's just a point of curiosity, the entire World Wide Web was put into this container, in disks, so just to get a proportion of, of what we're talking about, right? And it was, I think, 35,000 uh, 35, pounds, okay? Library of Congress, obviously much larger, but doesn't contain as much information, okay? Because there are all kinds of other issues that are related to copyright question, intellectual rights, uh, intellectual copyright, etc. So what should count as public record? Look back up there, Supreme Court, when I saw that, I, I was really worried. 70% of citation used by Supreme Court opinions are no longer in existence. They're gone. They're erased. Uh, for those who are interested, apparently they just did uh, a study in the UK where they found that the, uh, I want to say Labor Party, but it can be the conservatives. It really doesn't matter. Whoever was the last prime minister, Tony Blair, all his speeches were erased from the data, from the web of his party because they were embarrassed by what he said. So whatever he said as in public, as, as a prime minister, okay, public record has been erased and there's no reference to it. Unless some of you download it to your computer and print it and then can say, hey, he actually said that. But then when you go to the official website, you can't reference it. So think about that. So the power of the internet, obviously, is scary. Okay, so what, what should be the answer about learning in the digital age? As philosophically, we always answer, it depends, right? But I wanted to not be cavalier about it. It depends on what? What are you really asking? Are you asking learning under what ideological rubric? Are you asking in terms of enlightenment, in terms of indoctrination, in terms of skill set? If you're looking for skill sets, I would suggest close most universities because vocational training we can do with YouTube much easier than going to university. Okay, if all you're looking for is cashiers at Walmart, you don't need university system. Okay, so the question is, what is the question? What answer are you expecting? Again, if you're expecting to promote a certain viewpoint, we can tailor the answer 
uh, to the question. What is the purpose of even asking the question? Do we care about education in America? The president claims he cares about it. What do we do about it? Giving two, I think his latest proposal is two years free tuition to those who qualified into community colleges. I don't even know what that means. It makes absolutely no sense. Some European countries, as you may know, have very clear commitment, ideological commitment to higher education. After high school, or actually during high school, you are set to either vocational training or academic training. Those who go to academic training, which is a very small percentage of high school graduates, get free education. They're expected to become, I don't know if you're aware of it, civil, a part of civil service for, let's say in Germany, I know a little bit, uh, that already started with Humboldt. There's an ideology. There's what you expected. As a university professor, as I am at a state university, I'm a civil servant. By the way, I am. Okay? I get paid by the state. Therefore, I have certain civic responsibilities beyond just writing a paper nobody reads. Okay? What is it? Well, public lectures, all kinds of things, serve on committees that really further the future of the city or something like that. Okay? Being an oversight committee of the utility company, whatever it is, the ways in which you can do. So data set support, and so what the learning in the digital age one of the things that philosophically is bothersome is any answer you want to give to it, positive, negative, critical, supportive, you can find a data set to support it. So we're in a bind here. Okay? It's not very helpful. Practically, it also depends. Okay? Are, are you interested in education reform? If yes, what kind? Should we have elite universities and lower universities? The United States made the argument, yes, that's what we call community colleges, okay? We have vocational schools, okay? We have elite schools like the Ivy schools, right? That's supposed to take care of a completely different strata of the population, right? Not the people in Colorado Springs, for example. Are you willing to learn from mistakes? Have we tried any reform and see if it is a mistake or not and learn from it? Are we so worried about making mistakes that we are never going to try anything novel or interesting? Are you willing to spend time and money to find out what is the most useful answer? And the answer, once again, we are not sure. We have federal mandates that are then executed locally. How does that work? We have a president of the University of Colorado who has never been in my class. I think it's astounding. I've been teaching here for 30 years, and no president of the university has ever been to my class. I'm a great teacher. Why am I saying this? I've worked also in industry. I, I would venture to say to anyone in this audience who ever worked in the private sector that there is no CEO of any company or president of any company who's never been to the workshop, who doesn't know what his or her company is producing. We have a president of a university who does not know what we are producing. They haven't been in my class. How would they know? They get my annual report, I doubt they read it. It's in English, but I doubt they read it. So think about it. You want to be University of Phoenix? You want to apply a business model to higher learning? Guess what? Play like a business person. Market your goods. What are our goods? What is it that we teach? Do you know how to market critical thinking? If you don't, don't be a president of a university. Go be a president of Walmart. At least you know I'm selling this, I'm selling this, I'm selling that. Okay? Even the CEO of Walmart, especially the founder, knew every truck that left his warehouse. If you remember, that's how he succeeded so well. I don't think there's any president of any university who knows what trucks leave what warehouses. There's what students learn in classrooms. They don't. They hear online and say, oh, it's cheap, let's do it, let's invest in it. $5 million, the University of Colorado is committed now to spend on online education. Knowing nothing about it, never having taken a class in it. The president of the University of Colorado has not taken an online course. How does he know? At least, <laughs> the founder of Walmart 
knew where the trucks was going, know what was on the truck, how it was loaded. So if it's a policy question, practically speaking, then it's, it's politically driven, it's understood in financial term, and at some point it's going to support some ideology, left or right, okay? So for those who think that, for example, high education is a waste of money, okay? I'm sure there are people who think that way, especially in the state of Colorado. As you know, the state of Colorado is number 49 out of 50 in per capita support for higher education. Are you aware of it? Okay, we're number 49. The only state that competes with us is worse than us, number 50, the 50 states, is Mississippi. Race to the bottom. We will not support higher education in Colorado. University of Colorado four campus system gets less than 5% of its budget from the state. So it's the University of Colorado, the state university by name only, not financial support. Interesting, right? However, how does Colorado get away with it? Do you know how? Colorado is also number three or four in the country of per capita people with higher education degrees. Do you see the disconnect? They all come with their degrees here. To retire here, to do all kinds of things here. So we have a lot of people here with college degrees or post-secondary education but they were not indigenous, that is, they were not studying or not getting the education here. Even though we have 35 universities and colleges in the state, which is quite high for a state with less than five million people, or about five million people. Okay, last but not least, and I wanna finish with this, is that personally, as far as I'm concerned, uh, learning, whether it's in the digital age or in the stone age, is a lifelong activity. I think that any professor at a university who is any good is still a student. Okay? I still see ourselves reading books, learning new things, learning things we didn't know 10 or 20 or 30 years ago. And I really believe that that's the way it works. We also know that the more you learn as you grow older, the more you keep your mind active, the longer okay, you'll have quality of life or a better quality of life. And with this positive note, I'd like to end. Thank you.